Right guys, so we are back from Welsh Rosman 2023. First of all, a massive congratulations to Mitch the Moose Hooper. Mitchell Hooper who had an absolute superb competition and won 2023 Welsh Rose Man. Welcome to the club my man. Hopefully you'll come back next year to try and defend that title because winning it twice it's just as hard. I want to just talk about just everything about Welsh Shows, man. So, going on the back of an Arnold Classic result and how I was unfit and everything, you know, a lot of people look at you in a way that, oh, he's not going to do nothing, blah, blah, this, blah, blah, that. But, you know, I had 10 months off, went to Arnold's, not in shape, like I know, had an injury, and that's, I, and I had five weeks to turn that around to try and get ready for World Shows, man, which is a massive ask. I got my body in the best shape it could get into, and I went over to World Shows, man. Obviously wanting to win the 2023 World Shows Man and be a three time champion. But for once everything for myself went smoothly. The, the travel over there was nice and my suitcases all came. I was out Saturday night and midnight. So I had Sunday, Monday, Tuesday just to chill out and get kinda, you know, used to the used to the heat. That was the first time I was in Myrtle Beach. It wasn't as hot as Sacramento, but just to get used to where everything was, see all the guys, introduce myself to the new guys and just to get all the interviews and stuff done. So that was nice and chilled out, you know, we had some laughs, obviously did some content with some people. Um, I went and did a talk with some, you know, kids with autism as well. And, you know, a lot of families travel from all over America, so I'm very thankful for that. And it was great to be able to do that before Worlds as well. So I think everybody's seen the groups. I think every single group this year was stacked. There wasn't one group where you could go like, oh, he's going to get through easy or he's going to have it, you know, his own way. It was a very kind of stacked group, obviously. I was going up against Pavlo, who was, you know, Europe's strongest man, had kind of done a few of the events before. And for me in qualifiers and worlds, it's, I never get so much emotion. I never really kind of celebrate too much. I think I'm good enough to get to the final every single year at World's Strongest Man. If I don't make the final, that's when I can get disappointed. So I knew that, you know, I could come first, second or third in that group and still go through. And that's why, that's how my mindset always goes into the qualifiers at Worlds is like, why bust a gut? You know, if, if after two events I'm sitting in third place, why bust a gut to try and get into first where I can just, you know, I know I know that I'm the best in the world at Stones. I can, you know, get second, test my tacky out on the Stones and uh, go from there. So first event was loading, loading in sand, which was an absolute horrible event. I came second in that with a time of like 43 seconds. Pablo won with 42 and... You know, that's how kind of close it was because if you look at every other group, I think Mitchell was the only guy that had a faster time than me and Pavlo. So every other group I would have come, to, I would have came top in. It was a good to have Pavlo to be able to push me and do that. And then, yeah, that was that was very, very hard. The first event of the qualifier, that was an unbelievably hard event. It took me a lot of time to recover after that. My legs went were jelly. My whole body was just you know, shutting down. So, and it was really soft sand, so it was, like normal sand that you'd see on a beach you know, when you're running and you get like slower and slower and slower each time that's what it felt like like felt like i was sinking so it was you know it was a good and the good thing is it was an event that was really horrible but it was out the way early and all i needed to do was know i'd come top three that's what you have to do in qualifiers just come top three in every event and you'll be fine so that was that out the way and then after that it was deadlift machine and that was an event you know i've seen before but i've never done it before and i think I got six reps on that and I think that got me second place or joint second or something so you know, I didn't have to push too much in the deadlift which was good because we didn't have as good deadlifters so that was a kind of big bonus for myself and again it was confidence as well and you know, obviously the result of the deadlift at the Arnold to then having a deadlift bar rising from 280 to 380 it was nice to be able to actually you know, get the weight in and do, do decent on a deadlift um, this year and then Law Ladder was the last one in the event for the last one of the day and I was very confident going into this one. I knew that I had been working my pressing hard. I won it in 2020 or whenever it was last time. I And uh, yeah, I was going to confidence, won this one. And uh, yeah, end of the day on a high, really good that I could win the log ladder again. I think, you know, you look at people and say, oh, the best pressures in the world win this, but it's not the best pressures in the world that win it. It's the most efficient mm -hmm. people from the first log to the second log to the third log. Um, you know, I don't believe in viper pressing. I've never believed in viper pressing. I think people think that, you know, viper pressing saves energy, but it zaps you. You know, you have to work really hard to get it from your knees all the way up without the rest at the top. So, you know, the first two logs, anybody in the world could probably viper press it. But as you could see, people were getting really kind of tired after the third, fourth, fifth log. So for me, it's like you've got legs, 
you press with your legs, so why don't you use them? So I did that. As you can see, I was very co uh, consistent, very efficient, and my uh, walk to each log, you know, was very efficient as well. And that's, I think, how I won that. So, yeah, I got into day, day two, was in a good place, and I had three events left, which were uh, Conan's Wheel, and then the keg. Kettlebell. So the kettlebell swing, and then obviously the stone off if you go there. So, Conan's Wheel, you know, I was pretty... I mean, I was pretty annoyed that this came last, I think, in this one. Um, and again, I was doing very well, but I just kind of blacked out and just lost concentration. But the good thing about this is the qualifier. I'm in a good position, so I was able to afford to drop a lot of points. And yeah, it's just one of them things. It's, like I said, it's better to happen in the qualifier. So I was going into the last event, which was uh, Kettlebell um, Toss. I was going in there third place. So all I really needed to do, to do was I, I knew I wouldn't, couldn't kind of catch Pavlo, so because um, I know Pavel was really, really good at these as well, and he's not going to make a mistake, so I just wanted to finish at second, and that's what I did. I finished overall in second place, so then, although I'm the, like, the best stone at the world, I, I wanted to avoid Pavel and stone. I wanted to have someone like Bobby because I knew I wouldn't have to work as much, um, not being disrespectful or anything, but just through, through stone experience and you know past results. So the good thing about this was I was going in the stone off and the tacky because we had a big situation with the tacky we had a grade 5 and grade 6 for the stone off we fought grade 6 so we took it down it wasn't going on my hands it was just staying hard so then I said let's do grade 5 put grade 5 on and it worked so I was very lucky that we did that because then I knew exactly what tacky I was going to use in the final and I didn't have to muck around with it all and it was a bit of a panicky moment because I was like crap this ain't working but then I went out I think it was I got to four stones or something you know I'd went through and beat Bobby so it was quite nice because I was able to you know get a few reps on the stones didn't burn out any energy and uh yeah it was nice to get through to the final kind of unscraved and I obviously wanted to win the group but I did it the stone off and like I said it wasn't like Brian Shaw versus Rauno when they were doing eight nine reps it was literally just one rep forced of each stone, so I did basically the four reps in total, which isn't any kind of extra work anyway. So uh, we had a wee rest day on Friday, and Friday for me was the hardest day because obviously, you know, in the back of my mind, I have this kind of wee injury that you know I don't make excuses for enough, and it felt all good. But just I was seizing up on a Friday and not really being able to recover as well as I shoot, wanted to. But then went and got physios, had a drip, had an IV drip as well on the Friday, which really really helped. So I got amazing sleep. The the hardest thing about the world this year was their very long days. We were going to site every day at 6.30 and starting about 8 a.m. So, you know, 8 a.m. usually you're still in bed or having your first meal of the day. First event of the finals was Shield Carry and there was a big rain delay with this. We were meant to start at 8, but I don't think we started it closer to half 10. Um, a big storm had come, so that was very weird to see. It was sunny the whole week and then all of a sudden finals come and yeah, a big storm. So, yeah, Shield Carry for me, um, you know, I was confident because I've used the shield before and I knew that if people locked their hands that they would just drop it because when you lock your hands as soon as your hands go you have you drop there's no like take another two or three meters with it all and stuff like that so I think when it was me versus Mitchell Hooper when I was when we were at went up I think the best before us was like 50 meters I think people seen the video I was up to like 60 meters and then got to 63 and dropped it in 41 and the reason I think people are saying oh stupid dropping it and stuff it's cost you a title that did not cost me a title whatsoever like people that are saying that do not understand the point systems in Strongman and do not understand it what because I dropped it because I was probably 12 30 meters in front of um, Mitchell Hooper and thought right it, he would have dropped it he said to me even at the back as well he would have dropped it but I just dropped it I didn't realize I could have maybe got another two or three meters but honestly if I went another two or three meters he might have just kept it up for another two or three meters so to you know people can say this that and that but at the end of the day I did what I wanted to I did what I could and to start the World Strongman finals off of a second place was you know it was good enough for me and it was I think after that I knew it was going to be a bad battle between Mitch, me and Mitchell Hooper because I think we were so far in front in the shield carry that it was um, weird to think that more people didn't do better but I do have to say a shout out to Pavlo I mean Pavlo ended up winning the event but had, I got but got 19 or 20 metres taken away from him because he missed the foot and that was fair judging but we'll come on to I think more about judging and dumbbells and stuff later because I think really think if you're going to be strict on one event it has to come across all boards and you know I think there was some decisions and maybe we needed more judges and stuff that you know, to make that to make it better and fairer because you know you, there's no point having role meetings or talking to athletes before it if 
they're not going to follow up in, a, in you know in the actual competition big you know, shout out to Pavlo you know he took it like a man he said it is what it is it's part of the rules so there was no excuses moving on to the second second event of the finals and that was the deadlift this and Dumba were the two two events I was really worried about going into the final because obviously people have seen my Arnold results and I didn't even pull 360 off the ground um, so you know, for me I had to get my body back to kind of normal in five weeks and I did six reps off it it was a deficit did six reps off it and I did it in the, we did it in the rain as well so you know I kind of knew Mitchell Hooper was going to probably get sent I mean if I had locked out one more it would have you know, it would have maybe helped me get an extra point. But again, there's so many people on six and seven reps that we split so many points that Mitchell won it. So he got like, you know, he got all the points. So, and then second and third place, there were so many split points that, you know, we lost a lot of points through that. So the last event of the first day of the finals, finger fingers. And again, this event, you know, a lot of people think these events suit me, but again, if you if you know Strawman, my first World Strawman man, I failed to, I only got to the second finger finger and failed it. I'd never ever done finger fingers fint, so that was going in my back of my mind was like, you know, I needed to be aggressive, but I didn't want to be too aggressive in case I made mistakes. I was also going up against Brian Shaw, who's arguably one of the best, or probably the best in the world at finger fingers, so it was a lot of pressure, but I knew that I was obviously stronger and much more efficient than I was when I did them last time, so for me it was just, I just attacked them and just keep on being aggressive and driving through, driving forward. I, I always start slower than most athletes when I do these kind of medley things, but I don't tend to make mistakes. I showed that on the log and I showed that on fingers. You know, Brian was ahead of me. He was ahead of me all the way to the last one and then he just lost energy. But for me, I was able to keep the kind of momentum going, keep the aggression and keep the forward moment of, movement of kind of, you know, the swings going. And that really paid off because I ended up, you know, winning that event and going into the second day, one and a half points or something behind. So, you know, it was very kind of, a, bit, a good bit of positivity for myself. Um, you know, it was, I think it was between me and Novikov and Mitchell at this stage, and very, very close. But then, you know, slept on it. Going into day two, this was again dumbbell. I think Max Dumbbell and myself, or dumbbell events, and Tom Stopman do not go. And I think again, everybody, single person that knows Strawman, if they see a dumbbell event, they put me last. Like I would put myself last. I've put myself basically second last, second last, and nearly every dumbbell event I've done. You know, it started very dodgy for me. The first rep of the dumbbell, I actually failed and I had to do it again. So yeah, that was maybe just a nervous rep and maybe the occasion was getting to me a bit, but then I kind of had to get my head screwed on and be like, right, you know, I know I'm stronger than that. I've been hit, in the warm up. I hit a easy 120, you know, before we went out. So I was like, why am I doing this? So as you get heavier, the dumbbells were getting bigger. And I think having that small dumbbell put me off a wee bit because in the backstage, I was, you know, training with the bigger dumbbells anyway. The first lift got through safely, so that's that was alright, and it kept going up and up, and uh, it ended up being. I ended up going up to one thirty-two point five kg, which, you know, it, never ever I thought I'd get that, you know, and I didn't realise how many people were going to get it, and realistically, I thought right, if if someone was going to get between me and Mitchell, it would be the the, the dumbbell, and I think after the dumbbell, you know, I'll go on to my result in the dumbbell after, but I think after the dumbbell, that's when I knew it was basically an mission impossible because nobody was getting in between us. The biggest shot for myself was seeing Novikov. Because I, like I said, if you put your name on paper, on any dumbbell event, Novikov would be on top. Like, no matter what, everybody in the crowd, helpers, athletes would say Novikov, you know? And I think people were thinking the big dumbbell was going to get lifted. The big dumbbell in a million years would never be lifted. And that's just me seeing it because I've seen it at person. I tried to pick it up myself and it was impossible. So, yeah. Well done, Rob, for Rob for making it, but it was a better seat than it was a dumbbell. Anyway, I was, yeah, I was so, so buzzing with this because in my head, me and Mitchell would maybe get 132, you know, and um, let Novikov, you know, hit the 140s and that, and that would break up some points, but then, yeah, it didn't really work that way. I hit the 132.5, was absolutely buzzing. Obviously, went out and tried 140, didn't get it, but that was a massive, massive milestone for myself. I didn't really care after that what happened. I just wanted to... You know, because I was saying it in the qualifiers, I was doing interviews that I really, really worked on my dumbbell and I wanted to go show that in the final that, you know, if I can press something big, it might get me decent points. And I, I ended up pressing something big. You now I've got a big, bigger and better dumbbell than, you know, Eddie Hall and stuff from Britain. So it's it's quite cool to be able to have a British dumbbell record and to come third in the dumbbell, which, you know, again, if people don't understand strongman, that I've never, ever come, never not come in the top three at a dumbbell, uh, never come in top three at a dumbbell. So it was a... Uh, 
you have any special moment, but I think this is needs to get kind of dressed up upon as well as the refereeing in this. So, you know, I don't ever make excuses or I always think everyone needs to be in a fair game and take it back to the first event of the final, Pavlo, you know, I mean, it was clear that he didn't cross the line and, you know, rightly so, you know, he got things taken away. But in the backstage and that, we were saying like, you know, Novikov was making it clear that this is a lockout. No, like not doing this and rocking out or this, this ain't a lockout because you're not straight up. So, you know, to go over things like that with athletes and to make sure it's drilled into our head. And, you know, we get told that the judging was going to be strict to then have some like dodgy calls. It could end up changing the tie around, you know, because people thought I lost the title because I dropped the shield. But there was a lot of kind of dodgy, I think, lockouts. I think, you know, th this year we got a challenge that, you know, if we wanted to challenge reps, we could. And then that's just started getting messy before the, you know, during the event, people were just challenging. It was getting really messy. So they just took that away. And, you know, for me, if there's rules, rules need to stay and be told this is it and that's it. Like you can't just, because there's pressure on on you as a referee to, you know, keep the athletes maybe happy or that blah 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 whatever it is. You need to be fair. So you know, I know Magnus van Manderson is a very experienced straw man, very good referee, but I really think there needs to start being more referees to help him on the job. You know, what I mean, I think there should be one at the front and then maybe like one or two at the side. The more eyes you have watching, especially a Matt Stamba like that, the easier it is to judge. You know, Max events are so hard to judge if you're going to be really strict on you know, Pavlo for what he did in the shield, you have to be strict across all boards. You know, in my eyes, it's just like, do I go back training now and there's another dumbbell event? Will this be a lockout for myself then? You know, because like I said, you can't say to athletes and say to people that you can you can do this and you can't do that. But then when you go on to the actual, you know, when, when the day comes that uh, it's Max Dumbbell, it's an event, people are getting kind of stuff like this. It's like, you know, I know I got a dodgy rep last year for Magnus on the buying the net press. But you know, you can't change what happened. Mitchell hit the 140, very impressed him. But I really think there needs to be more than just one judge. Yeah, Mark, like I said, Magnus is a very experienced straw man. But having two or three faces to kind of, you know, just to have it, even with the shield walk as well, because, you know, for us to know where the line is, we have to actually turn and look at the people. Whereas there should be maybe two, two on the line telling you, shouting at you, yes, so you don't have to look across and they need to be right, right close to, like, so you've got one lane, two lanes, not someone in the middle telling you to go, you know, to across it, because it might not happen to Pavlo. If Pavlo had two people that he knew, right, these are the two people I look at, and as soon as his arm goes down, you can go, you can go, but that's just my kind of sum up of it, like I said, you know, I think a lot of athletes have the same feeling with it. I think that was a feedback a lot of it got was, you know, the refereeing has to be strict, the whole, you know, if it's going to be strict, be strict, if it's going to be lenient, be lenient in all the events, but everybody wants a fair competition, everyone wants everyone to have, you know, a fair chance, and the only way that's going to happen is I think if we bring more referees in, or if there's more than just one eye looking at, looking at an event, especially a max event, because even with, you know, rep deadlifts as well, when you're when you're when you're front on at things, people look like they're locked out, but if you have people at the side as well, then you can you know, they definitely see. But anyway, you know, after that event, I thought to myself, right, there's truck pulling stones left. All I'm going to do is concentrate on myself and see what I can do. You know what I mean? Judging by this as well, the truck pull for myself was far, far, far too light for Walsh Shaw's man. I got told it was heavier than last year's one. And last year's one, there was people on oxygen, people having nosebleeds. I couldn't walk for it for ages. Literally felt like I was pulling Luke's truck. Um, you know, it started off heavy, then the rope didn't even need the rope. And... I actually didn't feel any other weight as well. And I think you know, there was like five people that were on like 32 seconds. And for me, being a, being a world's strongest man stage, I think it needs to be proper heavy that you're just completing it or, you know, not many athletes are completing it because that sums up, you know, who the kind of strongest is instead of just having a kind of cardio-based kind of, you know, if it's cardio, make it cardio, make it hard. One thing again, which maybe could have changed, but again, I've kind of second in that. Make sure we finished that so there was nobody in between us again or nobody stirring up the points. So we were top two there. Then obviously going into the last event, in my head I knew, you know, there's no way possible that Mitchell's going to muck this up. You know, I know he came seventh or eighth at the Stones last year, but he's improved there. And no disrespect again, 210 kg stone in my eyes. And I think in World Strong's man, should, it should still it should be there. I think a lot more athletes should be completing stone runs than they are. I think it was only me, Mitchell, and Trey that had loaded all three stones. So I knew that 
as soon as me and Mitchell went up, there was only one person that had loaded five. All he had to do was load five and he would win. So I, I won the stones, obviously loaded them all. He loaded the five. He had to think finished second or third in there and won World Straws, man. But there are just a few things to take away because, like, especially in the stone off, like they said this year that the stone off, they, went, they changed the 210 stone to 200. And in my eyes, when you have 30 of the best guys in the world competing, why would you make the competition easier? You know, because in the stone off, if someone got up to that 210 stone, want, like got one rep with it, then went to the final, like, right, wow, I've lifted a 210 stone, I can do it. They do the exact same in the final, whereas, yeah, the, I think just the standard on that makes it the standard go down more. And I really don't really like that. You know, I think every year you should be trying to improve or getting harder. So I think every year 210 stone should be in it because as we've seen today, you know, as we've seen, sorry, over the weekend and over the week, there's only three people in the world that can, I'm sorry, I run up to 210 kg, which in my eyes at World Swords Man Standard, there should be a bit more. Like I said, the truck pull should be heavier, get us really, really working. Um, and I think just judging overall, so that athletes get the fairest result. I know, right, right, Pavlo did win that fair because there was five or six judges. Tom did win that because there was five or six fudges. You know, you don't want to be, you know, sitting there after and like, doing say like 10 reps on a deadlift and every single rep was soft but because the one judge was in front you got them you know that's I just think there should be much more eyes on it and you know we've said that to you know the world shows man before but they just they believe in madness we all believe in Magnus but at the end of the day Magnus has, is a human mistakes happen but to have the less likely chance of mistakes you need more than one pair of eyes overall I was very happy with my the result you know at the end of the day I've come the last four years at World Strawers, man, I've pulled him in the last four years and you're not going to be winning, you know, just because I've been the champion the last two years, I'm not going to be the champion for the next five, six years. It's basically impossible to do it. It's strength sport, anything happens. Brian Shaw won his first title, I think, at 30 years old. And I'm 28 and won two, plus got two runner-ups and I don't think that's ever happened in Britain either. So I believe after this result, I'm the most successful British strawman to ever, you know, walk this earth, especially at World Strawers, man. Like myself and Luke, I think, are the pride of Britain when it comes to Worlds. We're the ones that are getting to the finals, we are pushing the podiums, we are keeping like the British kind of strong man on the map for World Strongest Man as well. We're hitting records, hitting PBs, and you know, just push it with the best. So, yeah, like I said, although I didn't win, I came runner up again, which I'm buzzing about. Um, you know, another podium, if I can just keep podium every single year, I might. I'm, Let's put it this way, you know, I'm 28 years old. If I'm doing World Strongest Man for another 10 years, I'm not going to win Worlds for the next 10 years. It's legit in me impossible. There's going to be maybe like, you know, I might win it the next year and then not win it for another three years, then win it and not win it for another three years. But at the end of the day, I'm going to win five titles. And yeah, that will be over a 10 year span. I think what Brian Shaw done 15 consecutive finals and he's won four World Strongest Man titles. That's how hard it is to win. If it was so easy, Brian would be winning 15 right now. So that just puts it in perspective. You know, I'm so consistent when it comes to World Strongest Man. The last four years I've been on a podium, which I think is really unheard of. Um, so yeah, I'm very happy with how I performed. There's a lot of positives. Like I said, the Atlas Stone still winning that. Finger Fingers to win that. Dumbbell, my biggest shock of the day was that because when I looked at the events before Worlds and going into it, I was like, wow, this is an event that's going to cost me probably the world's strongest man or cost me a podium shot at least um but then i did you know really good in that trap pool top two so yeah you know it's just again something to take away that after five weeks went from the how my body and i feeling physically and mentally after the arnold's to then have five weeks of working hard it was really good you know i'm not going to be going now and having 10 months off i'm not going to be doing that again i'm going to try and keep my body conditioned and as ready for you know world strongest man next year obviously but the next competition i'll be doing I think is Royal Albert Hall. If not Royal Albert Hall, I'm definitely going to be doing Shaw Classic, Glasgow, Rogue Invitational. Uh, I maybe go to Cardiff for the deadlift, depending how it is. But right now, I've got my eyes set on Royal Albert Hall. So you know, I'm not just going to be doing Worlds now and going away. I need to keep, like I said, keep myself in my comp mindset, so in comp mode, so my body kind of keeps condition. So yeah, next few months I'll be training for Royal Albert Hall. Go down there smash that i want to hit podium every single comp i do now so that's the next big goal is for the next four comps i've got this year is to podium on or at least win them so that's the world Strongest man recap i can't wait to get over to the shot class at four as well i've missed that last few years and 
you know, I hope Brian Shaw won some, I'm going to 1 million percent be there, see everybody, put a massive performance in there, and then the same with Glasgow and Rogue. So, <coughs> like I said, guys, thank you for the support. Your support means so much to me. I think everybody could see it at Worlds. I, you know, I, I you know, gave my t shirts away to kids, signed loads of stuff, you know, spent as much time as I could with the fans because you guys are the ones that help us get to where we are. Like I said, you know, I just wanted to touch base on some of the refereeing and how we can make you know the sport grow a, as a whole. But again, massive well done to Mitchell Hooper for being the world's strongest man. Enjoy it, enjoy it, enjoy it. And then also Novikov for coming third. Again, another podium finish for himself. And you know what a battle it was. And then Luke for finishing you know eighth place. Another top ten finish for us as and we cement ourselves as the world's strongest brothers. But anyway, I'm gonna go and start working hard for Royal Albert Hall and we'll see you guys in London and then we'll see you guys in Colorado for the Shaw Classic. Guys, so today I'm going to walk you through the walk quiz. Hey guys, this is week one of the Atlas Stone tutorial by Tom Stoneman. Right guys, today's tutorial is 